All right, Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to start with verse 18 from chapter 12, because it should actually be the first verse of this chapter. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave it his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon, for, they had given his, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slaughtered. Let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive into captivity, you go. If you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, and on its behalf, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound had been healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of all. And by the signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who could not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Also, it causes, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. So there are a lot of variata, which is uh, differences in the early, early manuscripts. There's, in chapter 13, there's a ton. Before we get started, like uh, the number 666, there is a variant reading, which is 616. Um, so the number of the beast is 616 in some manuscripts, but that one actually also makes sense. Uh, and they mean the same thing, so it's kind of cool we'll get to that. I don't know how actually cool it is, but... All right, so chapter 12 introduced us to the activity of Satan. Chapter 13 gives us more detail about his activity. So now we're going to do some beast, beastie background. So the Greek word for beast is therion. There's a great metal band by the same name, which is why they picked that for their name. <coughs> yes, it's, they, they pronounce it therion, but it's, it's the the with a long e, therion. Um, that word usually refers to a wild or dangerous animal or a truly evil person when it's used. Uh, In the Old Testament, beasts are instruments of God's wrath. So that's Daniel chapter 7. And if you really want to nerd out, if you read Daniel chapter 7, 4th Ezra chapter 11 is an extended commentary on Daniel 7. Uh, So 4th Ezra, that is, I don't think that's even in the Apocrypha. That's in... Is it just in the suit? Is it in the apocrypha? Just first and second, second, yeah, second answer. No. Try again. No, only third. Oz- no, fourth, fourth. Yes, yeah, fourth Ezra is in the apocrypha in the Slavonic Bible. Yeah, it's in the Apocrypha, so you can read 4th Ezra chapter 11. Um, and you can also read 1st Enoch chapter 60, uh, which talks about Leviathan and Behemoth. So that's your beast from the sea, Leviathan, and Behemoth, the beast from the land, which is the second beast. 
Uh, so again, imagery being drawn from the Old Testament as well as the Book of Enoch. Uh, the beast from the sea represents, because the sea is always a symbol of chaos, uh, so this beast from the sea represents a fearful chaos and destruction caused by man's rebellion against God's law. The beast from the earth uh, is like a copy of the lamb. <coughs> right? It's a copy, it's a, because Satan always imitates. Uh, so compare it to the lamb, it has a wound that was healed. It looked like it had a deadly wound mm -hmm. that it, right? Um, it insinuates itself among man and works from within rather than control them outwardly. So the beast from the earth represents false teachers. We'll talk more about that. It's not a real beast that is going to come crawling out of the ground. And the beast from the sea is corrupt human government. Governments. Uh, so the, this beast from the earth, the second beast, aids the dragon or aids the first beast in destroying the church, which that's been going on for a while. So verse 1 through 3, a beast rising out of the sea. So we see how Satan tries to mimic the triune God. The first beast he brings out of the sea mimics the son, and the dragon mimics the father, which and, uh, gives that beast power and throne. The father gives his son power and throne. Uh, we can also see this beast mimicking the sun because it's an object of worship and it suffers a fatal wound but lives just as the sun is our object of worth, worship because he suffered a fatal wound, death by crucifixion, uh, but lives and was resurrected and ascended. Okay, the first beast bears blasphemous names, uh, which is another parody of the sun because he bears the divine name, right? Okay, so this is the beast claiming to be God, basically. It's like, yeah, I, I want to be God. Uh, different names on the different heads, okay? And by the way, that statue, it's not what's in here. In chapter 13, it's part of it. Um, it was a great the, the one in here, The one in here is a chimera. Uh, the different names on the different heads of this beast just means different methods of deceit because that's what this that's what the devil does he deceives okay um, this beast is not distinct from Satan okay so it's Satan taking the form in an attempt to imitate the incarnation of the sun and again it's all figurative that's what we're seeing in this vision uh, but it's figurative he's not really going to put on a dragon outfit, suit, whatever. Maybe, but I doubt it. Uh, just as the lamb is seated on the throne of God and shares God's authority, so the beast shares Satan, the dragon's throne and authority. Uh, and then the description of the beast, you know, that leopard, bear, lion, all the other things comes from Daniel 7, 3 to 8, where Daniel there depicts four beasts, referring to four successive evil empires. So this is where we get this beast is about corrupt human government. So Daniel describes leopard, bear, lion. He's talking about, um, oh, and they're condensed. Here we see in this vision they're condensed into one beast. So it was Assyria, Babylon, the Greeks, and Persia, I think. So... Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and the Greeks. Um, so the Greeks? Yeah, that's the Greeks. So the three king, main king, four main kingdoms that took, tried to trash Israel. Right now, they all get squeezed into one, which is like you had all these world powers, and they all got squeezed into <laughs> one. Who's the big world power right now? In this time frame in the first century. So what's the, what's the big world power? Rome. Rome. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so you had Greece, you have Syria, Babylon, Persia, now you have Rome. So does this beast also kind of represent Rome? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah it's going to be an allegory that people then could understand, like, yes, this is coming from the Old Testament, but 
they'd also understand, oh, he's talking about Rome. He's talking about Rome. Yeah, he's talking about Rome. Now, we know he's talking about Rome because we have the benefit of hindsight, but it also speaks to corrupt human government of all times and places because guess what doesn't change, which is the point, right? Okay. Uh, so Rome, yeah, is, is, the, is the beast. Okay, they worship the dragon for giving his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Right? The lamb is worshipped because the father gave him his authority and no one is like the, war, the lamb. No one can make war against the lamb. He is the one who is able to make war with the beast and conquer him. In fact, he already has through his death and resurrection. Okay, so again, this beast is mimicking the lamb. It's like, oh, you got, you got seven eyes and seven horns. I have like ten heads and ten crowns, right? Blaspheming against God, the beast testifies that the dragon is the true God, right? Which is the ultimate blasphemy. So he is also blaspheming against the saints, showing Satan's contempt both for God and for God's people. Then verse 5, that 42 months, that's the same 42 months that were mentioned earlier, 1,260 days, uh, time and time and half a time is the other phrase that's used. It's all the same thing. Um, the beast's blasphemy and his activity as evil assault on the church will be intensified at the end. We talked about there's going to be this little season of Satan where it's going to get really, really, really bad. Everybody's like, oh, is it now? No, it's not. I, really, really, really bad. Uh, when he will be unbound to deceive the nations. Uh, we'll see that in Revelation chapter 20. Things will be bad, really bad. Uh, all who dwell on the earth will worship it, it says. The beast. Everybody's going to worship this thing. Everybody. Everybody likes. Uh, everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life. Like, oh, okay, believers. There's still going to be some believers. Who was slain before the, the, the book of the Lamb, who was slain before the foundation of the world. Um, that's an interesting phrase. There's a phrase in this version. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation. <laughs> it's different in different versions. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slaughtered is what the authorized version has. What does ESV have? That's 13... <coughs> 8. 8. Mm -hmm. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Okay. And then other manuscripts have, or was written in the book of the life of the lamb that was slaughtered from the foundation of the world. Uh, very interesting, quite different meaning. So what, what that is saying is Christ was crucified from the foundation of the earth. Like, what? That was 2,000 years? And like, well, no. It's like God knew he was going to do this. So from before, before God created anything, he knew we were going to screw up. He knew he was going to send his son into our flesh. He knew he would, this was how he was going to die. From before the foundation of the world, this plan was in place. Uh, that's what that means, that he was, he was uh, slain from the found, before the foundation of the earth. Then you have, oh, our names are written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, which is predestination. God knows who his believers are going to be. Um, does that mean... You have no choice. Yeah, you do. You still have free will. You can choose to, you know, you can choose to tell God, no, I don't want what you're offering me. Okay? But God still has perfect foreknowledge. He knows the choices you're going to make. It doesn't mean you don't have the freedom to choose them. He just knows what they'll be. There's a difference between foreknowledge and predestination. So he knows... He knows what you're going to do before you do it, but that doesn't mean you don't have the choice to do it. Do you follow me? He just already knows we're going to do yeah. it or not do it. Yeah, so he knows what the outcome is going to be, but that still doesn't mean you don't have the free choice to make that choice. You do. He just knows how it's going to turn out. Right? So you do have free will, even though we are predestined. Uh, and then there's, you know, Got to throw in the pitch for double predestination, which is some are predestined <coughs> to heaven and some are predestined for hell. We don't believe that. It's like some are predestined to be damned. No, they're not. No, that's heresy. Um, 
Because then, then you have situations like oh, someone who is faithful, and very devout, great faith, but they're predestined to hell, so they go to hell. That's dumb. Mm -hmm. But sorry for people listening at home. It's a little harsh, but yeah, that's dumb. Okay. Um, yeah, so everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, which is a translation I like. Uh, there is no middle ground. Either you are with the Lamb or you are with the, with the beast. There's no fence riders. There's no conscientious objectors. There's no, fen there's no nothing. There's no middle ground. All unbelievers, by their denial of the Lamb, worship that first beast. They belong to Satan. Believers can be assured of this salvation because their names are written in the book of life. Um, so even during the little season when it comes, whatever that's going to be like, believers can be comforted and know their salvation is secure by faith. Uh, you know, the book of life, you don't really hear about that anywhere else in the Bible other than Revelation seven times. In Revelation, it's mentioned seven, seven times. There's that number again. That number comes up a lot. Yeah, it does. Can I, can I interrupt you just for mm -hmm. one moment? It was, this was a question I was going to ask you. It was about something in Romans about the four new. Mm -hmm. This verse, I had a question. It was Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I guess my question was, for those who foreknew, wouldn't that be everybody? Because he knows us even before we're in the room. I think this, this threw me. I didn't quite understand it. Why am I being dense? I lost Romans. <coughs> First, second, first, in Galatians, who is in Romans, Galatians, who is Romans, Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Romans. Come on. Is it in a different order? What's going on here? I feel stupid. That's not the revised version with the 20,000 uh, amendments, is it? Yeah, because I can't read. Yeah. Romans what? 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. We know that uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Yes. Yeah. Okay, which question? For those he foreknew. Mm -hmm. So, wasn't that everybody? He knows everybody. He knows us before we're even born. Yeah, but in context, it means those that it's, it doesn't mean you know those he foreknew, which he it, it doesn't mean all people, even though he knows all people. But it's those who he foreknew as his own. Is it like once he chose? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the predestined to be like Jesus. Yes, ultimately. Okay. And the point of that verse is to show us a difference in perspective. So that's showing you God's perspective. It's like, okay, in God's perspective, all this is accomplished. It's done. You are in the image of Christ. Okay? Okay. To us, that's in the future. Right? We are looking forward to that good work that was begun in our baptism and will be completed on the last day. We're looking forward to that, but in God's perspective, it's already accomplished. Right? It was accomplished before the foundation of the world. Because he's outside of time Because he's and outside space. of time and space. Right. Okay. Is a way of thinking of it. That makes more sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that's giving you kind of the God's eye view instead of our view is, you know, God, Jesus died in the past so that I can be justified in the future. But to God's perspective is, all this happened, so you're my child now, period. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go full nerd. Uh, so ESV actually is wrongly translating the last half of verse eight as everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. 
the phrase before the foundation of the world goes with the lamb who was slain, not the names written. The reason why these translators went to that incorrect translation is because it didn't make sense to them that Christ was slain from before the foundation of the world. But the Bible is clear that the atonement of Christ transcends time. Okay, the Old Testament saints were saved through faith in the crucified Christ. Okay, they, they had faith in the promise that the Messiah would come and save them. And they died in that faith, and that's accorded to them as saving faith, even though Christ wasn't going to come for thousands of years in some cases. Um, so the crucifixion took place in time. Its effects are eternal. All right? And they were applied before the historical event took place. So you can think of it, if anybody's a Doctor Who fan, the easiest way to think of it is Doctor in Doctor Who canon, they talk about fixed points in time that cannot be changed, but the effects of that fi fix, because the effects of that fixed point ripple through time and space in all directions. So that, that's a, a key event that cannot be changed because its, its effects permeate all the rest of time and space. So it's actually a pretty good analogy for thinking about the crucifixion, about how that point in time, it happened at a specific point in history, but its effects transcend time and space. Uh, is anybody a Doctor Who fan? I just like go for yeah, it. Okay. Uh, but the ESV translation, even though it's an incorrect translation, is not theologically incorrect. All right. So even if you don't take my word for it, go, well, I'm going to go, that's what the Bible says. I'm going, well, it says, Hi. even though I don't agree with the translation, that translation is not theologically incorrect. That's the wonderful thing about most of these things when you dig into them in the Bible. It's like, oh, but if this is, a, if this is an error, it's not an error. It's a translation thing. And nine times out of ten, you, it doesn't matter. That's what's wonderful about a lot of stuff in the Bible like that. Say, like, oh, it has all these contradictions and errors. No, it doesn't. Uh, you just got to work through it. So even though it's incorrect, I think incorrect translation, it's not theologically incorrect. The names of the elect have been written in the Book of Life from the foundation of the world, Revelation 17.8. Uh, so we can say that both the elect and the atonement were accomplished facts from the foundation of the world, from God's point of view. From our point of view, they happen in time, but God is outside time. So either way, you want to read that verse, it doesn't matter. Theologically, they're correct. Uh, verse 9 and 10, uh, the emphasis is on the endurance of the saints who, though they are persecuted and killed, are conquerors because of Christ. It's a warning not to be led into the world's ways of captivity and murder by the sword. And I'm not talking about being a soldier or being in a war. Um, it is a it's spiritual warfare. It's like, don't, just because the things you say, is like, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm, no, it's better to die. It's better to die and be secure in your salvation than to toy with well, I'm going to get along to go along until this is over and maybe it'll get better. Mm, no. That never gets better. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that'd be okay if the Nazis come back. But the Nazis can't affect your salvation. <laughs> These false teachers and like, oh, yeah, it's like, oh, we'll just I'll play along with being Muslim or something. No, don't do that. Ew. Yeah, don't do that. I never would. You're going to have to shoot me. Okay, the second beast that comes out of the earth, that's the parody of the Holy Spirit, because this beast directs worship huh, to the first beast, which that's what the Holy Spirit does, moves us to worship, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit directs us to worship Christ. So we have the unholy trinity. You have the dragon, the imitation of the Father, who gives authority. The first beast, the imitation of the Son, who has the healed fatal wound and is worshipped by the unsealed, the non-believers. Second beast, imitation of the Holy Spirit, directs worship to the beast from the sea. Was I supposed to set a timer? No, I got it. Okay. Uh, the second beast, imitation of the Holy Spirit, directs worship to the beast from the sea. 
the great signs produced by the second beast, because it's always about the signs, bread and circuses, right? The second beast causes people to make an image of the first beast and to worship it. Ah, oh, fantastic. And the second beast does all he can to bring attention to the first beast. An example of the manifestation of that beast in the first century is seen in the emperor worship and uh, its temple cults. So right after the first emperor, who was first emperor? I'm in a quizzing mood today. Who was first emperor of Rome? Caesar. Caesar, which one? Julius. Julius Caesar, right. Gaius Julius Caesar. Second emperor, his nephew, Octavian, renamed himself to Augustus Julius Caesar, uh, and then declared himself a god. So he is the first emperor to declare himself, well, not the first emperor ever, the first Roman emperor. Second Roman emperor, first one to declare himself a god, and then he declared his uncle, nephew, uncle, yeah, uncle, uh, had him declared a god too. Uh, so this cult of worshiping the emperor spread throughout the provinces. I don't think anybody really bought it in Rome, just because like, I don't think politicians really buy some of the nonsense they, they say they in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but when you get out to, well, plus they knew they were it was a game because they have the augurs and the priests who like look at the signs before you can have a meeting and, you know, and read the entrails the, to make sure, you, <laughs> you know, and then, oh, if, uh, you know, the robins don't fly the right way, you know, it's going to be a bad day to have a war, you know, and they were all on the take. Mm -hmm. It was all bribery and stuff, so. No, lifetime appointments for the priests, by the way, so I'm just saying. Uh, but you had these emperor worship and temple cults, which were rampant in the provinces. Uh, we talked about that way back in chapters one and two. We were talking about the, the seven churches. Uh, and the images of the emperors were worshipped. Uh, Luther saw the manifestation in his time as who? Who's... Oh. The Pope, right. So Luther saw the manifestation of the second beast in the papacy. The point is that beast manifests himself in different ways in different generations. The papacy is still a manifestation. Okay, he, They are teaching things that are not God's word as if it's God's word. Okay, So he is still the office of the papacy, is still the Antichrist. Uh, but there are other manifestations in our day and age. Okay, uh, you got the church growth movement. Which, what's wrong with church growth? Well, the church growth movement is an actual movement, uh, ecumenical movement, that was like, oh, well, how do we, how do we get butts and pews? We gotta go. We have to go win souls. Fine, I've got the hour-long presentation. You can go into somebody's home and do it. I did a report on it for school. Uh, and when you first look at it, you're like, what's wrong with this? This is good. Why aren't we all doing this? Till you get really down to the nitty gritty and realize. There's all kinds of false teaching in this. It's all about you and what you can do for God and what, what you, decisions you can make. Um, now, then you have American evangelicalism, uh, decision theology, all the same thing. Uh, denial of the sacraments. Right? All these false teachings. Uh, they manifest themselves every so often. They've done it throughout history. They will continue to do so. All the old heresies, all that's old will be new again. I was even joking with Ed this morning. Uh, Job's friends, the ones you're not supposed to listen to because they give him bad advice. And it's like, yeah, that one's Roman Catholic, that one's Baptist, that one's... You can almost make that joke of their theology because it's the same bad theology that keeps popping up. Even Job's buddies, you're like, oh, well, he must have done something for this to happen to him. And I'm like, I wonder, wonder what sin he did. You've got to confess. Okay, so all this stuff comes around. Again, it always does. Nothing new under the sun, right? Then verses 15 and 17, and now they get this beast trying hard to mimic the Holy Spirit. He comes upon the first beasts uh, so that he could speak and make people worship him, just like the Holy Spirit came upon Christ and filled Christ throughout his ministry. Also, those who don't worship the first beast will be killed, just like those who deny Christ suffer eternal death, right? Further, this beast gives a mark the name of the beast. Now we're getting into the good stuff. To all who worship the first beast. So just like believers in Christ, it's a parody again. Believers in Christ are marked, sealed with the divine name in baptism. It's not a literal mark. It's not a microchip. It's not, not the, the iPhone. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the barcode they're going to put on the back of your neck. 
It's not an RFID chip that you're going to implant under your fingernail. Okay, it's, it's, it's a spiritual mark. Okay, so just like we don't receive a literal mark. I mean, we don't brand babies when we baptize them, okay? But you receive the sign of the Holy Cross on your forehead and upon your heart. And that's even before you even get baptized, right? Uh, the name's upon the what? If everyone's going to die who didn't believe in the first beast, then the rest of us, we don't got to worry about the rest of us then, because we're going to be dead. Hmm? So, let the beast come, right? <laughs> okay. Right, so, the beast gives a mark to all who worship the first beast. Those who don't worship the first beast will be killed. Only if they get a hold of it. Bring it up. Yeah. Okay, so the divine name, we are sealed with the divine name. Just like the dragon knows who are his by the spiritual mark on them. They are his children. So that's telling us again that there's no middle ground. Either the believer bears the divine name or is an unbeliever, which therefore by default makes him bearing the name of the beast, Satan. Right? Hmm. I thought demons couldn't hurt us, so how are they going to kill us? They can like do bad, scary things, but they can't hurt, hurt us. How are they going to kill us? probably all the other terrible things we have in the world that we do ourselves. You know, they do influence. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, they cannot physically, they're not going to physically just come and strangle you, but they are going to make sure the church is persecuted. Right? Well, then we'll just grow. Hopefully, yeah. Church usually grows in times of persecution. Yeah, no, don't forget, this is still symbolic. Now, at the end with this little season, whatever that's going to be like, then, yeah, all bets are off. Can they hurt us then? Maybe. I don't know. It's not entirely clear. Like, right now, if you're afflicted by a demon, he can't, like, rip your eyes out. Okay? He can't physically hurt you. He can induce you to harm yourself, but he can't physically, like, push you in front of a bus. It doesn't work that way. At this little season, at the end, is that a possibility? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It's kind of, it's a weird time and it's not clear. Uh, so maybe they can physically hurt you. I don't know. Okay, that's fair. Possibly. But the confusion comes where if we were supposed to be killed, if we didn't believe in the first beast, then who's going to be left at the end besides all the demon people? I don't know. There are strange things in this chapter grammatically and everything else, and I'm not using that as an excuse. I'm, I'm using that as I am not skilled enough in Greek to sort out all this stuff and actually understand what some of these people are talking about when they get into the real nitty-gritty of all this. It's very confusing. I guess we'll find out someday. Yeah, yeah and, every, and every commentary is a little different. <laughs> so, One way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm armed. I'm ready. All right, so verse 18. <laughs> Number the beast. There's more tea if anybody would like any. Oh, my goodness. Beth, I like you. You have faith, you have guns. <laughs> you probably have six months of food in the house like I do. About a year's worth. <laughs> I've been fighting demons for, uh, it'll be 28 years on March 5th. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, yeah, bring it on. So. Not afraid of a dragon. I'm not afraid of anything. It is what it is, you know, so... Ugh. I just had help getting through my little COVID thing, so I was very grateful for that. Okay. So you got me through it twice. Mm -hmm. The number of the beast. Well, wait a second. The mark on the right hand, what is that a parody? Oh, or the forehead. So I get the forehead, but what about the right hand? What is that? Okay, so Jews used to wear these things called phylacteries. Phylacteries, or is that their curls? Oh, I think the curls are called phylacteries. These are called, they wore a little leather box that has Bible verses on their forehead and on their right hand. Mm -hmm. yeah, box? Yeah. Can I Google it? Tiny, yeah, it's tiny, uh, t -t tough, t uh, starts with a T. So that ends up with the grievous sore. You know. Yeah. They only did wear it when they're praying. 
Um, and and uh, Orthodox still do it. Why? Hmm? Why? Because they think the Bible tells them to. If you do a very strict literal reading of some Levitical stuff. Phylacteries. It is phylacteries? You I thought that was her curls. You were correct. Okay, yeah, phylacteries. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Oh, Teflon. Tefellon. Tefellon. What? So, um, yeah, so, that, so that's, that's, that, it, it's, okay. that's what that's referring to. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a parody of that. Yeah, so again, it's not, well, that's where they're going to put the chip. Right, that's right. Put the QR chip. code. Right, right. Yeah, right. In your hand. <laughs> because that wouldn't even make sense back. Because it's got to be something it's that. It's got, yeah, the number one thing, when, when right. again, when reading, especially apocalyptic literature, even though we believe in literal interpretation of the Bible, we literally interpret it based on the kind of literature it is. So if it's history, mm -hmm. then it's real literal history. You know, if it's prophecy, then it's real literal telling us to repent and turn back to God. That's what prophecy is, not mm -hmm. fortune telling. But if it's apocryphal, it means it must be some kind of revelation in, in, in picture language because that's what apocalyptic literature is. Mm -hmm. So that's how we interpret this stuff. So it's got to be imagery drawn from somewhere else to make us think of something in the past that will go, oh, that's what's <laughs> happening now or is going to happen, continue to right. happen in the future. So regardless of what kind of literature it is, when we're interpreting the Bible, it better mean to those people at the time those words were first written, it better mean the same thing to them as it does to me. Right. And if I decide it means something different to me than it did to somebody in the first century, well, then I did it wrong. Mm -hmm. Because the word of God doesn't change. The meaning doesn't change. Right. So if I go, well, yeah, that was long ago. And that's the problem with a lot of these uh, new interpretations and modern interpretations of what's going on in the Bible. So, well, that's what it meant back then. But today we can't say that. Yes, you can, stupid. Because the, God's word doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So... Whatever it meant to them then, it has to mean the same thing to us now, right. whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not. So if it seems like, well, people were sexist and racist in the Bible, not really. They had very distinct roles for men and women in that culture. And yeah, our culture's changed, sure. Mm -hmm. But the idea of, of submissiveness and headship in a marriage it hasn't changed. We've diluted it because men have really dropped the ball on doing their duty in the family. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it doesn't count. You know, it doesn't mean a lot of things we try to make it mean, which I'm not talking about marriage today, but that's just one example of people like to trot out. And then don't get started on the, well, the Bible says you're supposed to kill homosexuals. No. Jews were supposed to kill homosexuals till the Messiah came and the ceremonial law no longer applied. Throw all that Leviticus stuff out. Uh, it doesn't apply. There are churches today that teach that. Yes, there are. But hmm. again, that's interpreting the Bible incorrectly. Right. We are not Jewish. The Messiah came. We do not have to observe all that stuff. Peter, rise, kill, and eat when he had his dream of all the food coming down on the blanket. And it's like, oh, I'm not eating that. I'm a Jew. I'm not, I can't eat that stuff. And God said, don't call unclean what I have made clean. Right? None of that ceremonial law calls. Is homosexuality a sin? Yeah, it is. So is sleeping with someone that's not your husband or wife. It's the same sin. It's sexual sin. It's adultery. It's sin. You can be forgiven. You can repent. But so is stealing a and piece so, of gum. It's a sin. Yeah, it's a sin. Sin is still sin. But did we have these punishments where I have to kill you for it? No. It doesn't apply to us. You know, likewise, if I have a funny looking mole, don't show it to me. I don't want to see it. And you don't have to do that. <laughs> so please don't do that. Why would... Because there's this stuff in Leviticus about skin diseases. And you have to go show it to... After seven days, go show it to the priest. Please don't. <laughs> Probably. I, I like what to see. What a fun part of your job. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't want to see. I don't want to see your hairy mole, your psoriasis, none, none of that stuff. No, thank you. And plus, you don't have to. So, thank you. Abolition of the ceremonial law. So, in all seriousness, it's got to mean the same things, but you got to interpret it correctly. Um, 
Anyway, gotcha. the number of the beast. Ah, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. There is so much mystery and confusion about this number, but there shouldn't be. Um, St. John is told that the number of the beast, 666, can be calculated, and that it is the number of a man. So St. John and those Christians living in his day are told that they can identify the historical identification of the beast in time. As it turns out, they can because the numerical value of Nero Caesar turns out to be 666. Uh, unless, and if you use Hebrew letters and do the Hebrew number thing that they have, uh, and if you actually technically it's Neron Caesar, gives you 666. Nero Caesar without the final end gives you 616, which is what the variant readings in this first of Revelation also give you. Some of them do say 616. 666 uh, is actually a transcendental number, too, because so once you divide it out, it's 6 to infinity. All right. So using Hebrew numerology, uh, which was called uh, uh, gematria, uh, which was a popular way in which Jews and Christians could speak, speak out against the Roman emperor without the emperor knowing. Nero Caesar in Hebrew is Neron Caesar, comes out to 666 when you add together a numerical value for each of the seven Hebrew consonants, because remember there was no vowels. R equals 200, S equals 60, Q equals 100, N equals 50, V equals 6. R equals 200, N equals 50. So here St. John is told that the ruthless emperor of Rome, Nero Caesar, who ruled from 54 to 68 and brought horrific and terrifying persecution against the Christians, was a manifestation of the beast. Christians of St. John's day would have understood that very, very clearly. Now remember, John is writing this nearly a generation after those events. So Nero, 54 to 68. John's writing this around 90, 95, 98, right near the end of the first century. A fun thing, you can also uh, transliterate the Greek word therion, which is beast, uh, if you transliterate that into Hebrew and calculate it using the same number stuff, you also get 666. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that Nero Caesar is the only manifestation of the beast, as we said. Uh, there will be many other manifestations of the beast throughout history. Come on. Hitler, Pol Pot. Uh, <laughs> what? What she said. <laughs> Who'd you say? Oh. <laughs> He's not alert enough. Right? Be the right. Anyway. Right. He's the puppet of a beast. Okay. Beast puppet. All right, there'll be many, many, many manifestations of this beast throughout history. You can go back, you can look, you can see it. Um, Satan manifests himself in the form of this beast in many and various ways throughout history. Nero's just one example. Each generation will witness further activities of the beast, which is why each generation says, maybe this is it. Mm -hmm. Look at this guy, it's the Antichrist. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. There'll be another one. This is mm -hmm. going to keep happening. Uh, we see the action of the beast in the papacy today with the denial of justification by faith alone uh, and all the other false doctrines and practices and all the other false churches teach. But again, the beast manifestation is not limited to the papacy, much as Luther really wanted to make it that way, you know. But he thought the world was going to end in his time, too. Mm -hmm. He thought that was, that was it. So the key is the number 666 has absolutely no relevance to us today. This is a, one of those historic things. So this is something that happened in time, and he's an example to us this is the kind of thing you look out for. It's like, oh, yeah, this number means Nero. Who is Nero? Go read Wikipedia. Holy crap, this guy was evil. Okay, now you get it. This is what the beast looks like. Mm -hmm. Now watch out for him in your time. Okay, that's what this is teaching us. So you can have multiple antichrists yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and basically there's one capital A antichrist, and that's mm -hmm. Satan. Right. All right, other, all these other ones, these are, these are all... You know, wannabes. This is a lowercase a. Right, right, right. Okay. Yep. I think of these different governments, like, you know, like North Korea mm -hmm. and, you know, even 
Like the Taliban, all that stuff. Yep, the Khmer Rouge. Right. The Nazis. Rome ish. Yeah. I mean, they're pagans, but. Uh, it's throughout history. You see it mm -hmm. all over. All right? But this number doesn't mean anything to us today. Uh, it just means, okay, you'll know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at this beast. Look at this guy. See what he did? Now you'll know what true evil looks like when you see it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Now, before we leave the significance of this number 666, because why? Why 666? Other than Nero's name came out that way. Now, remember, Roman guys, they had more than two names, so you can probably come up with all mm -hmm. kinds of numbers to mean his name. Uh, but this number 666, another way of looking at it is as Satan, as hard as he tries to mimic God, always falls short, right? Because he's not God. He's a fallen angel. He's not even close. All right, so the number of God is three. All right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity. But the perfect number, which symbolizes his relationship to the world, is the number seven, which is why the number seven keeps coming up in this book. All right, three for the Trinity, four for the created world. Put three and seven together, and you get seven which is the perfect relationship of God with his creation, all right? Uh, and the four comes from the four corners of the earth, even though they didn't think the word, the word is not flat. They didn't think the world was flat either. <laughs> the Greeks proved it was round thousands of years ago. I don't want to hear from flat earthers. Uh, they knew the world was not flat. But you have these expressions, the four corners of the world, the four corners of the earth, the four winds, mm -hmm. right? Because there's four cardinal compass points. So four always came to mean the created world. All right, so Satan in his attempt to mimic but God tries to get the 777, a trinity of seven. And he can't fall short, 666. Mm -hmm. All right. What is interesting is that when you take the name Isus, Jesus, right, and calculate it using this Greek number system, you get 888. And you'd be like, oh, uh, you would think it'd come out to 777 if that's the number, right? But 888 symbolizes the truth that Jesus brings about the fulfillment of all things. He is the one who brings the eighth day. What's the eighth day? It's the first day of the week, the second time. So Sunday, mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the eighth day. Uh, so we talk about like circumcised on the eighth day. That's why it's the eighth day. Uh, this cycle of the eighth day comes up. Uh, the number eight. Uh, he is the one that brings in the eighth day, the eschatological eighth day. Eschatology is the end times. So the eighth day, the last day, is also referred to the eighth day, and the eternal kingdom. Uh, and that's like it. That's it for this chapter, which was quite a bit. Interesting chapter. It went kind of fast. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So next week we will look at 14, and we're going to see more weird stuff. But I mean, this, this, is the, this is one of those chapters, there's several chapters in this book that people study Revelation for that, the four horsemen, right? Um, this chapter with the beasts, and the number of the beast, and the mark of the beast. And it's like, oh yeah, this is where, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where I'm going to find out all the nitty-gritty stuff about it in the Bible. And it's like... <laughs> And that's all it means? Yeah, that's all it means. Mm -hmm. It's not that mysterious. It's not that deep. Um, it's horrifying when you realize hey, all these things are happening and they've happened before and they'll continue to happen. Uh, but it's not some deep, dark... We're so used to things in movies like horror movies and, and well, you know, if a baby's born with the mark of the beast, that's the Antichrist. Yeah, no. That's fiction. That's not Damien. That's, yeah, it's not Damien. It's not Damien. It's not an omen. <laughs> now, if I hear Gabriel's horn, I'm in yeah. trouble. It's not, it's not because of a prophecy. <laughs> Christopher Walken is not going to perch on my rooftop. Those are great movies, by the way. Oh, yeah, they're entertaining. <laughs> but like none of that stuff has any basis no. in reality, unfortunately. Or well, fortunately. That would be really terrifying if it was. Some of the stuff coming out now, I mean, there's... They're slurring everything good, where they say the Archangel Michael is uh, uh, evil and the super angels are out there doing harm to everybody. There's, 
I mean, there's yeah, there's wait. programs out there that are really mm -hmm. really weird. Yeah, and we'll actually we'll actually talk about some of that because we're going to be coming up to the vision of Christ the Victor, Christus Victor in in Revelation, and we'll see kind of Michael again, and we'll talk about him. So that's where we'll leave it for this week.